for the cosplay, I think I would have to say Thanos because I think I identify with Thanos because <laughs> like Thanos, I'm always trying to do what I feel is the right thing for everyone around me, but I'm doing it in the wrong way. So <laughs> uh, I think that that would probably be the most representative of just who I am at my core. Like, I, really, I really just want to help because I just want everyone to have a better life. Greetings, Dragon Con. <laughs> What's up? Hi. Thanks for joining us for the golden age of audiobox discussion. Um, so sad we are not walking the con wearing our superhero costumes. Jonathan is wearing his fire ant tee, and that's most important. Um, <laughs> and most of us, I think, put pants on for the virtual panel. Short. Uh, yeah. Short. Okay, that'll do something. Uh, so I'm Victoria Gherkin. I'm the head of acquisitions at Podium Audio. Uh, we are an audio first publisher that specializes in bringing the best indie sci fi and fantasy stories into the audio realm, including fan favorites like Expeditionary Force and Spellmonger and all the audiobooks that our panelists will discuss today. Um, they will all be future fan favorites. Uh, the audiobook market has been a real bright spot in the publishing picture. Um, the format has produced double digit growth over the last five years, and this increased demand for quality audio entertainment has provided golden opportunities for authors and performers alike. Uh, one of the most exciting things about audiobooks um, is the new audiences that we can reach. Um, people who might not have had time to read an ebook or watch TV uh, can find time to experience these stories wherever they go, even if they aren't going anywhere in COVID times. Uh, but the ironing still needs to be done. Um, and what here we're here to discuss today is what that increase in audiobook listenership means for the creators, um, both for authors and performers that they collaborate with. Um, a podium audio, we provide, we pride ourselves on combining the author's story with just the right voice or voices and publishing wonderful audiobooks with something new for our fans every day of the year. Uh, the goal of our panel today is that we want to take you inside the booth and give fans, readers, and listeners some insight into how the magic is created. So enough of that preamble. That is the sort of thing that we'd edit out of our audiobooks uh, when producing. So let me get right to the story um, and introduce our esteemed panelists uh, and open the conversation about the golden age of audiobooks. Uh, so we're going to start with uh, Robert and Nick. Robert, uh, Robert Ross is the author of the best-selling Sentinels of Creation um, print and audiobook series. His new series, published by Podium Audio, is Paradigm 2045 and represents Robert's first foray into full-length science fiction writing. The first of three books, Trinity's Children, was released just in time for this year's Dragon Con. So get the hot buns while they're hot. Uh, Robert has a passion for pop culture, all things Star Trek, Doctor Who, and SpongeBob. Um, and while Robert can make obscure TV book and movie references, he sadly like lacks any sense any of his paradigm characters' genetic enhancements. <laughs> to the contrary, he is quite sure that brain space taken up by all that trivia is directly responsible for him having no sense of direction whatsoever. We can ask your wife about that. Um, in addition to his work as an author, Robert has led the artificial intelligence and experience design efforts for a number of Fortune 100 companies. He's also a keynote speaker at Georgia Tech and an adjunct professor at Kennesaw State University. While Robert's first series, Sentinels of Creation, was written as urban fantasy, Paradigm 2045 leverages the hard science side of his experiences while still weaving in the humor and character banter, which are all hallmarks of his writing style. Robert lives in Atlanta, so very convenient for Dragon Con normally, uh, with his wife, kids, and about 11 different Apple products. He's a fierce advocate for children with special needs, their parents, and the local organizations that support both. Um, and Nick, uh, by day, Nick Podell gives voice to a multitude of characters that heretofore only existed on the page. He has narrated a few books, hundreds, over the years and received a few awards um, because of it. Now, Nick's modesty didn't allow him to include the awards in his bio that he sent us. So I'm going to name a few. Audible customer favorite, an Audi, uh, which is the Oscar of the audiobook world, and several earphones. So I've done my part. 
Uh, by night, he balances time as husband, dad, and amateur armchair general. His castle stands proudly in the mitten state where he and his puppy dogs hope for snow each and every day. So guys, uh, you became friends and creative collaborators long before Podium came along uh, to publish Paradigm for 2045. Um, tell us how you met. Robert, go for it. Uh, so I, when I wrote um, the, my first series, um, I had I was already a huge fan of audio books. Um, so um, I actually wrote it as an audio book series. <clears throat> I guess what that means is that some of the dialogue is a little bit different in in, in how it uh, is normally kind of processed for for print. So. Um, uh, I knew that that was something that was really paramount in terms of how I wanted people to consume uh, the, this story. And <clears throat> I was actually a, a big uh, fan of, of Nick's work uh, ahead of time uh, and had actually uh, really thought that, you know, this would be a great opportunity for us to work together, not really thinking that this was, you know, going to happen. Because I, I didn't know how old he was. I didn't know how long he'd been doing it. I just knew that there was a couple of different books that um, I really enjoyed and thought that would resonate well with the characters because a lot of my characters do a lot of um, quick banter back and forth and there's a lot of uh, dialogue between male and female characters and i think one of uh, nick's great talents is his ability to, to uh, hold all those people in his head at the same time it causes all sorts of dysfunctions mind you but <laughs> but it's uh it's a it's a real gift and so i, I had written to him uh just out of the blue and i said hey um would you be interested in doing uh, a book like this? And I described it to him uh, and I, I said, hey, can you be a Scottish woman? And he said, absolutely, I could be a Scottish woman. Uh, but I'll pause there and let, let uh, Nick respond a little bit to that first email. <laughs> so yeah, actually, uh, I went back and looked through some of our early emails here prior to this also. And it's kind of cute how, uh, how professional we were back then. And that was I think four years ago was the the first stamp because my eldest daughter was 10 months at the time and she's five now. So yeah, almost, um, almost five when we started. Yeah, dating. almost five. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Um, and so uh, I had just started uh, fairly recently into the indie author um, realm of producing audiobooks, And um, so I, I liked the descriptions that Robert had given me about his book and the characters sounded a lot of fun. And um, that's that's a big thing for me is like, are the characters going to be fun to give voice to? And so I jumped on it pretty quickly. Um, and I was really thrilled to hear that he was excited about the collaborative nature of the project because, um, you know, some of the some of the projects that I've worked on, the, the authors are a little bit more, um, I'll, I'll say, take a back seat to the to the audiobook production side. You know, they'll they'll give a little bit of input or some none. Um, but Robert seemed like, you know, this was something that was really important to him and he wanted to be a part of the process. And so um, I really enjoy those collaborative projects. And so I was I was pretty excited. Yeah, the the voices that um, that you you do, Nick, are amazing. I've listened to several of the audiobooks that you've um, you've narrated for Podium, and you you can fool the listener into believing that you are a different person, and that's that's such a skill. Actually, I'm looking at the way your face is moving now, and you actually have quite an elastic face. I don't know. Is that, is that offensive? <laughs> no, no. I mean, maybe somebody would find it offensive, but I don't. I take it as a compliment. <laughs> I think this could be, this could be how, how it happens, how, how you make the Scottish lady sing. <laughs> Thanks for that, Robert. Yeah, yeah. No, you are, <laughs> your ladies are amazing, Nick. Your, oh. ladies, your ladies are very lady. Thank you. Um, so another, actually, one of our our head of production, Emily, was telling me about how much you prepare for for the the books that you um, you take on, and it's you know it's not a, a light lift. Uh, I've heard that you spend several weeks at least on on each audiobook. So tell us a bit about your your process for preparation and how you know whether the author is you know 
super involved um, and giving you um, direction on on how that particular character needs to sound or or if it's just something you you know you create out of whole cloth or out of the book sure so uh, it it's dependent entirely on the on the project the length of the project but um, with every project that I undertake, I completely read through the manuscript word for word, um, completely all the way through before I even set foot in the booth here. Um, I need to know just everything that is in the book before I can start giving voice to it. Um, and so depending upon how long the book is, will determine how much time I spend in prep before getting into the booth. Once that's done, then I'll usually uh, either reach out to the author um, if, you know, like with Podium, if they provide me with the contact information or go over the materials that they've been given um, that they will then send on to me for any notes on characters, like if they have specific accents in mind or if there's, you know, tonal qualities that they want included in those characters so that I can keep those notes with me as I'm recording. Um, in the case of working with Robert, you know, he and I, um, you know, we started before the collaboration with Podium and um, we would go back and forth with uh, with different character samples. Like we would try four or five different Kellens and then six different Shannons. And he would say, like, uh, I I liked this of number six, but can you include the speed of number three? And. Um, you know, a much more involved process, but I think that it, in the end, it makes for a much better final project because we just got more ears on the project. And I think that that's, that's a huge thing with audiobooks. Um, you know, and I've done the ones where I don't get a lot of feedback from an author or some, or, you know, um, a content provider or something like that. And it's still really good. Um, it's just, it doesn't have that same polish that, say, something like this would have where there's more more creative juices flowing back and forth. Yeah, I think that's especially uh, important for if something's going to be a series and uh, and multiple, you know, significant number of books. Um, the first book's so critical because you can't really change the voices afterwards. Um, I've, I've experienced it a few times when, for whatever reason, the series had to change um, either narrators, which is the worst, or they just didn't go back and check how the voices were done. Um, and uh, people really don't like that because they get they get invested in these characters and they know what they're supposed to sound like. And uh, they are not shy about letting you know that um, that you did that wrong, not just in how you voice them uh, or how someone voices them, uh, but how you write them as well. They're not not shy at all. Oh, audiobook them. fans are, they're, they're rabid. Yeah. Some of our, our authors have told me that when they're writing sort of book 12 in a series, the audiobooks are great because they can, they'll just go back to the beginning and, and listen to, you know, the series in audio. And then that helps them with that consistency with writing the next book in the series. Um, Robert, did you, did you give Nick a, any particular challenge uh, in, in this series? Were you, did you uh, write particular characters just because you know his skills so well? Um, yeah, well, the, 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 the real thing that he does better, I think, than anybody is, is be able, being able to on the fly uh, switch between characters um, and have so many of them uh, discussing something. And again, that's really, uh, my, my books are very dialogue heavy. If you remember the television show Moonlighting from, I'm dating myself from the, I guess, the 90s. Um, <laughs> they, they, were, they went out as they, they were just with the largest scripts. Their scripts were like this. And so, so my books are like that when it comes to, to dialogue. So <clears throat> I remember when I, when I started thinking about um, Paradigm 2045 with, with Podium, the only thing that I knew was the first two characters. Um, and, and, uh, and it was the second of, the, of those two that was most intriguing to me, uh, Charlotte Amandi, who's the main character. And I knew that she was a Kenyan woman. So I was like, hey, Nick, um, my next book's going to be a Kenyan. The Kenyan woman is the main character. And his first reaction was, Good luck on finding your narrator. <clears throat> I don't do Kenyan women accents. I've never done a Kenyan accent. I was like, oh no, there's plenty of guys in this book and you will be doing it. So that was the first challenge. And I remember when he first got it started, he said, so what, what is this, what are you gonna sound like? And so he started doing a whole bunch of different video clips of these different women 
uh, with these beautiful Kenyan accents. Um, and uh, I think he did an amazing job. So, but that was that was the main uh, challenge for that one, I guess. And singing Sinatra, I made him sing Sinatra. I always try to throw something in each book that tortures him. Um, and uh, and this time it was uh, it was singing Sinatra. Yep. You're going to have to raise the bar for book two. I know, <laughs> right? What's next? I yeah. almost don't want to know. <laughs> something. Belching happy birthday or something. Oh, I have to learn to burp <laughs> on command. Oh, too funny. So Trinity's Children, uh, which is book one of the Paradigm 24, 2045 series, um, published right before Dragon Con. Um, it is available on Audible right now. And uh, actually, we put in a special treat for anybody buying the audiobook. You can download a beautiful um, illustrated cover that is signed by the artist and Robert, and you can uh, use that for your wallpaper. So that is a special bonus that is available alongside the audiobook um, on Audible. Aha, there's Jonathan. Um, <laughs> So, so Jonathan, um, I wanted to talk to you about a different kind of collaboration um, that gave birth to uh, your book, Hell's Horizon. Um, just let me uh, give the folks here a little idea of who you are. Um, Jonathan Brzee is a retired Marine infantry colonel. I feel like I should sit up straighter when I say that. Um, and now a full-time hybrid writer who is still unpacking his move from his move to Colorado Springs uh, with his wife, Kiwi, and twin 18-month-olds, uh, Danny Gadorn and Darika Marie. I hope I pronounced those right. Uh, he's over 75 titles in publication, mostly in the military sci-fi genre. Um, he's perhaps best known for his United Federation Marine Corps universe. Uh, he was a Dragon Award finalist for best military sci-fi or fantasy novel as well as a two-time Nebula Award finalist. And he is a USA Today bestselling writer. Hi, Jonathan. Hello, happy to be here. Glad to have you. Glad you've, you've sat still for a minute, having moved from uh, Las Vegas to Colorado Springs. Not an easy move with twins in the summer, in a pandemic. <laughs> uh, so um, it seems like yesterday I talked to to Richard about this book you guys were cooking up uh, in Vegas at a bar, and and here we are. Uh, tell us um, about creating the story uh, with audio in mind, and how did you guys manage the writing process? Well, I've known Richard for quite a while. You know, he's a West Point grad. I'm an Annapolis grad, so we always uh, kid each other about that. And uh, we both, li I lived in the Las Vegas area where Richard lives. And as combat vets, um, we know how soldiers tend to dehumanize the enemy, but how important it is, how imperative it is for commanders to understand the opposing commander as both a well-trained human with the same motivations and emotions as their own. So when Richard approached me about exploring this idea and we started discussing it, um, it became clear pretty quickly that uh, co-writing a book with this theme would work really well in the audio format uh, with each of us writing one POV, one point of view of mm -hmm. one character of two opposing commanders. Um, that would let us show both the, uh, the, the each side of the conflict and what was motivating the each, each character. Uh, wasn't going to be easy, though. <laughs> uh, you know, we met for uh, several dinners, some very nice dinners and lunches, hashing out the general storyline. And we kind of thought that, well, we didn't want to have good guys and bad guys. So we had to make sure that we were having both attributes being shown by each character. And, and we basically hashed out the battle and what was going to happen. Um, yeah, I've read, I've, read the, um, I've read the book and it, you really have achieved that. You don't, as a reader, you don't have um, either sympathy. Well, you 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 swing right with depending with, on who you're reading. That's what we were hoping yeah, for. Yeah, with the sort of feeling like which side you're on. This is sort of it's not the reds versus the blues, but it's you can you can see why each commander is making the decisions that he's making and is hating the other guy. It's, it's you can totally yeah. <laughs> And 
what, once we had the basic storyline, what we did was um, I started by taking the, the POV of uh, Captain uh, uh, Mateo Alcazar, who is a Marine infantry commander. And Richard took the chapters of uh, Major Emil Richter, who is a hegem hegemony paladin commander. Uh, in a basic sense, I would write a chapter, send it to Richard. He would write a chapter, send it to me. I would write a chapter and back and forth. But it, yeah, if, it, if it had been that easy, it would be, it'd be a, lot, a lot better. <laughs> um, the tough part was we had to make sure, because each one of us, even though we had the basic storyline, we each had an idea of where it was going and what was happening. And we had to make sure we didn't step on each other. Mm -hmm. uh, saying that, uh, you know, uh, writing, I was writing something that went against what Richard wrote or Richard wrote something that was against that I wrote. And we took a lot of hashing out and more than a little bit of negotiation for a couple of the things. And did that experience actually then end up in the book? Like, do you feel like the, the characters were sort of battling it out in sort of a meta, a meta yeah, way? Yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way, but I would say, yeah, because we did battle on a few issues mm -hmm. you know, because we're two different writers. We have two different styles in a way, but mm -hmm. we had to make sure that this whole thing flowed as if one writer was writing it. Mm -hmm. And because many times we could, and we did diverge. So then we had to come back and say, Oh no, no, we got to do this. We got to No, that won't, that doesn't make any sense. They would never do that. My character would never say that because sometimes we were writing dialogue for another character. So for those chapters, we really had to run that back. And Richard would say, no, Richter would never say that, or he would never do that. Um, so that took a lot of work. And the second thing is, since we knew from the beginning this was going to be an audio book, um, we had to make sure that we wrote it in that sense. You know, there's, uh, as was mentioned, you know, there's differences in the dialogue. There's differences in, in the blocking. Mm -hmm. Because um, there's one thing to read something and see the words on paper. But it's another thing when you're driving a car or you're, you're relaxing by the beach and listening it on audio, um, there is a difference. And we had to, we had to discuss that um, quite a bit. But in the end, I, I think we had a cohesive novel that, that flows from one character to the other, not two separate novels. And I may be biased, but I think I think it's a dang fine book. I think so too. Well, for your dang fine book, uh, <laughs> cost two dang fine uh, TV actors. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Eric Dane um, of The Last Ship and obviously Grey's Anatomy um, and Giancarlo Esposito, who was most recently in The Mandalorian. And remind me who is which character? Who is Teo? And Teo who is Giancarlo. Giancarlo is actually one of my favorite actors. Awesome. Loved him in Breaking Bad. Loved him in Better Call Saul. I mean, he just captures you on the stage. And so when you told me, or, or when you told me that he was doing it, I just had a little happy dance. <laughs> I, I'm not a big. I've met a lot of celebrities in my life throughout what things I've done. I'm not a big celebrity chaser, but he's an exception for me, and mm -hmm. I think he fits perfectly because Teo is a. Um, he was what we call a Mustang. He's an officer who rose up from the ranks without going to school, going to the academy and stuff like that. He's a blue collar, bare knuckle brawler who has a chip on his shoulder and is always thinking he has to prove himself. And I think Giancarlo is the perfect voice actor for that. I think he nailed it. Whereas with Richter, Richter is a, um, he's more of the establishment. Uh, now, Something happened, so he's his, not, not through his fault, but a family member, so he's on the outs. But he is more of the establishment, the person who's checked all the boxes. Um, he has a, a, this is how officers act. This is the right way, and this is the right way. And I think Eric Dane um, brings a sense of gravitas and maybe a little bit more cerebral strategic thinking, yet he's also able to show the anger that's bubbling inside Richter as Richter realizes that his future with becoming a general and everything is probably not going to happen. So I, I think podium. Yeah. I think you guys just nailed the casting of this. And I honestly, I, I didn't know who was going to, who was going to voice particularly tail. Mm -hmm. um, I had no idea. I was just going to say, okay, that's up the podium. You know, whoever does it, does it. But like I said, I danced around the room and went running over to tell my wife 
uh, that, uh, of course, she was pretty happy with McDreamy. Eric <laughs> but but uh, I think a lot of, you know, a lot of people, uh, Richard's wife was very happy with that one, too. Nice. Um, but uh, I, I was just overjoyed. Uh, I really was when Giancarlo agreed to do this. It's great. Well, we've, we've got both um, pieces in the can, but I, I haven't I haven't heard yet. I'm, I'm really excited to um, to hear the full production, um, which we are publishing October 13th. Um, so in just a couple of months to go and then you can do your happy dance again. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about this. All right, so now we have our two Swiss Army knives. Wow, that is a collection of guitars right there. <laughs> you actually caught me making a note because as we're doing this, Amazing. Matt texting me stuff I got to do later. So, <laughs> yeah. I, I knew you were finishing up with the previous guest, and I just wanted to cash Kyle in a, nice. in a compromised position. That was, that was my, my goal throughout all of this. Was, um, was one of the to do is dusting your mandolins? Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. So this is what's left over from my from my years of touring. I, I thinned the herd, and these were the ones that were keepers. And so, nice. nice. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let me give you. I'll, I'll do the formal bios to introduce you guys, and then we'll get into the chit chat. Um, so we have um, Matthew Medney. Um, Matthew is a writer of all things. Uh, he's the CEO of the generational and legendary heavy metal magazine. In addition, he co-founded Boutique Storytelling Company and Hero Projects, uh, where he presides as CEO as well. Uh, a 2011 graduate of the University of Massachusetts Eisenberg School of Management, Matthew quickly moved into live events, where he operated as a tour and production manager for nearly a decade um, for artists such as Cheat Codes and Kezo, uh, while traveling across 45 countries. Um, I bet you were glad there wasn't a pandemic when you were doing that. I, we, Kyle and I talk about that all the time. That I have so many concert tickets in my drawer that will be maybe used in 2021. Anyway, back to the story. Um, oh God. So the 200 plus shows uh, Matthew produced, uh, Coachella, Ultra Music Festival, Electric Daisy Carnival, and Lollapalooza topped the list. And in 2011, at Electric Daisy Carnival in Las Vegas, Matthew met John Connolly, uh, who is his co-author on Beyond Kuiper? Instantly, and is an aerospace and, engineer, and an aerospace engineer that uh, will last them a lifetime. In 2015, they began the Beyond Kuiper universe, asking the simple question: What if they don't find us worthy? In the intervening years, Matthew co-founded Hero Records and Hero Projects, combining his passions for music and storytelling. And in 2019, Matthew took the helm at the world greatest science fiction, fantasy, and horror brand, uh, Heavy Metal. Leading both Heavy Metal and Hero Projects, Matthew spends most of the time thinking about the unknown. Matthew's first novel, Beyond Kuiper, uh, looks to bring us closer to the pure excitement for the great beyond that drives him every day. And his collaborator in the audio edition is Kyle, Kyle Perrin. Uh, Kyle is an audio engineer, sound designer, and composer living in Los Angeles with his wife, Amanda, and his son, Ellis. Uh, for a decade now, Kyle has been entrenched in the music industry as a music director, producer, and guitar player, as evidenced by his studio, uh, working with several prominent artists in several genres, including rock, pop, hip, indie, hip hop, and metal. Kyle has performed and recorded alongside top talents such as DMC, Starly, Katy Perry, Logan Henderson, and countless others while spanning the world on prominent tours. In recent years, deciding music wasn't enough, Kyle opened the door to sound design and audio storytelling. A creative professional across many forms of entertainment, Kyle quickly adapted to this new medium, becoming a leader in the field over the last two years. Kyle has engineered, sound designed, and scored some of the most successful podcasts, animated shorts, and digital premieres online, including stories such as Another Kingdom, Season 3, and The Cold War, What We Saw, both Daily Wire productions, alongside Heavy Metal Entertainment's podcast series, Wonder Verk. So we say wonder work. His <laughs> main goals are to operate at the highest level possible, be uncompromising on your creative path, and emphasize the significance of creating meaningful, impactful moments in storytelling. So we are we have an audio book. I don't we're calling it uh, an audio experience. The yes. Audio experience. It is a 
fully produced, music included, multiple celebrity performances. Um, I should actually let you guys talk about it. Uh, so <laughs> tell us how it pushes our understanding of, of what a traditional audiobook is. So yeah, I mean, I, I guess it would it would start maybe four years ago when Kyle and I met while I was running a uh, record label that I owned with Sony Music called Hero Records. And Kyle and I kind of, you know, could stand each other in a room for more than five minutes, which was uh, more than we could say for most other people. Right. Almost all other people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and, you know, uh, while we were doing that, I had the idea uh, for Beyond Kuiper with John. And while we were writing it, Kyle and I were like, let's let's try to change the way audiobooks are uh, are done. I think Kyle Kyle once said we're uh, we're taking the rock and roll attitude into into audiobooks, which I think is uh, pretty apropos for what, what this book is. And Kyle and I produced a 20 track album uh, for it. And then Kyle uh, voiced, uh, I don't know, at this point, what, 50 different voices, 60 different voices um, and sound design. Kyle, why don't you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely a, a very heavy workload um, and we're not out of the woods yet. We still have some uh, some little you know, eyes to dot and T's to cross on things. And um, yeah, it, you know, it really just began with the, with the, the really simple vision of like, what can we do to, you know, take this medium that's really well loved and really, really well respected and just kind of come into it and, and just put our personalities on it. And, you know, we're not trying to do anything that's better or worse than anybody else. We're just trying to do our version of it and, and hopefully it's responded to well, you know, so it's just, you know, we always ask the simple question of just like, how far can we take something, you know, and that's really what drives us in terms of um, the, the the music that we wrote for it, just, you know, the 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 character development that, you know, you're going to see from from Matt and John throughout throughout the book and um, just all the sound design and just the the soundscapes that I'm I'm helping support or excuse, sorry, I'm using the soundscapes to help support the world building that's going on. So we really just always ask, how far can you go? You know, and once you hit the end of that limit, then then you know, and then that's when you stop. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think uh, you know, from my side, Kyle has really you know pushed those pushed those boundaries, and you know used used pauses and and empty space to create emotion in a moment that you know when I wrote it, I thought of those that kind of syntax, but actually seeing it realized into. Uh, a form that I can consume without reading it, but actually like hear it with, you know, music and a pause and then an emphatic moment. Uh, there, there's this one moment with our main antagonist, Odine Speck, where he says, we are the arbiters of justice. And, you know, on, on the page, it, it reads really um, strong and and has like this, uh, this almost Thanos-like moment where right and wrong is blurred based on what's right for the larger group of people. But Kyle was able to take those words and, you know, wizard it around with <laughs> with a lot of um, uh, nuance through the sound that really created this oomph moment. And you know, as we as we start rolling out some of these previews, people will hear it. But the uh, the general concept of Beyond Kuiper is, you know, we're not alone in the universe. The universe is alive and well, and the Galactic Star Alliance has 600,000 sentient planets, but, you know, we are just not a species worthy of inclusion at this time. We're, you know, we're, we're surrounded by this asteroid field that we call the Kuiper Belt, but the galaxy calls the Sea of Rocks, which is a military installation used to quarantine solar systems that are too hostile to interact with the rest of society. And as we, you know, work through that conundrum through the lens of humanity, it's really important to distinguish when we're in an earthbound uh, narrative versus a galactic narrative. And, you know, Kyle and I, and to Kyle's credit, has really, you know, understood the nuance of those differences through sound so that now this, this cohesive book, you know, you can close your eyes and you know, really understand at at what sort of you know mode you're you're working in, and are you in a space or are you on Earth, and where are the perspectives, and and that's kind of really tied together nicely through the the sound. 
Yeah, and you've created a the soundtrack, right? Yeah. The audiobook, and then you're gonna you're gonna release that separately. And that. and with the audiobook, uh, yeah. if uh, if Maggie is here somewhere or uh, Emily Durr, we uh, we are working to to get the. Uh, Oh, yes. That's part of the audiobook, which I think will be the first time ever that an audiobook has an accompanied soundtrack uh, within the one the one purchase. And I always uh, I realized today I was talking about it with a friend and it is the uh, it is the digital version of, you know, an album and a book that you'd buy in Urban Outfitters five years ago. And now we're just kind of bringing that to the digital space, which is, I think, really cool. And to, to Kyle's point earlier, you know, that, that that's pushing the boundaries, you know, within a certain, you know, vector and figuring out how we can, you know, complement that with things that maybe were more traditional or uh, print and bring that into the digital space and, and putting our own twist on it. Yeah, because I mean, you've done that with the, um physical edition, you know, that you've included artwork, you know, interstitial artwork in the pages. And so it's almost like you've taken the same philosophy that you brought to the physical book. And now, you know, the audio doesn't, it can't be the same. Like it can't, yeah, we can, we can, you know, attach a beautiful cover and we can have maybe some illustrations downloadable, but the fundamental experience is, needs to be as enriched as you envision the um, the actual physical book, so it's very cool that you know that enriching is via music and you know other notes that you know we're being creative about how to you know put your footnotes in and that sort of thing. Exactly. So, dude, this is a twelve book series. <laughs> Kyle, are you ready? Are you ready? Are we going to yeah. be talking about this at DragonCon in twenty years? Maybe. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> How long is this? How long is the um, has the composition and the, this whole thing taken? About so the the book was conceived in 2015, mm-hmm. right? So so we've been John and I have been building the world for about five years. I think Kyle, we broke ground on the soundtrack two years ago. Yeah, maybe I think it was a little under two years ago. It was definitely well over a year ago. Whenever we started kind of conceptualizing how we wanted to go about writing that but yeah it's been a while i mean it's been it's been a long time coming and you know we we kind of eased into it and then you know as time progressed we just got more and more immersed in the workflow of of having to get it done you know so it's been a while for sure but you know i think that we're setting ourselves up to where you know all of the the books that are coming after this now we can kind of build off of this foundation that we've made and we can just kind of keep the ball rolling it always it's always more difficult to start something from scratch than it is to just maintain and help something grow you know so i think that that's why we were really careful about how we how we began this i'm most curious for how you're going to keep track of what voices you've used for what characters as we get you know deep into like yeah. books four and five Pro Tools presets. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. 100%. You can ask Nick Podell for some tips on uh, on voice notes. I know. I've I'm you know, voice <laughs> acting of all of the things that I've done with throughout my career, voice acting is the most recent. So yeah. um Actually, I, I see in the margin here, Nick uh, Nick has said Pro Tools for the win. Yes. <laughs> so That's, they're on the right track. Yes. So you're gonna have some, so. some notes. I know. I, so what I've been doing is because like a lot of the uh, um, obviously a lot of the human voices are just me doing my best to represent that in the most dynamic way possible. So that it doesn't feel like a flat performance. And with the alien side of things, I kind of get to cheat because I get to use some pitch shifting and some some different types of processing to kind of really lean into that to make it exciting and fun for the listener. Because you don't want to hear me have a deep, burly voice for a human character and then just a 1% different deep, burly voice for his alien counterpart. You want him to sound insane. And so um, that's it's been really fun. And I get to flex some of my muscles as an audio engineer with stuff like that uh, and, and a sound designer. So um 
that's been that's been an adventure for sure. But, but the best is the uh, the outtakes of different human voices. I hope I hope you still have those. Your 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 Boston one is, is fantastic. Oh yeah, one of the characters is a is a is a deep East Coaster, and he's from Boston. And one oh. of the one of the notes that I got early on for voicing that character is like he's basically Matt Damon from Goodwill Hunting. And I was like, okay, so let me lean into this. Matt was not banking on me being able to do a really good Boston accent, and he was like, you know you went too far with it because this guy sounds crazy. Um, I like, I really, really, really leaned into the Boston and I've spent a lot of time on the East coast too with on tour. And I have a lot of friends that are from Boston. And so it was pretty easy for me to like take 20 minutes to kind of work out the kinks and the nuance and, and I lost, you know, tell us where you'd park your car, please. Uh, oh, Do I don't, I'm not in the zone right now. Oh, um, oh, in order for me to in order for me to do that you have to hold up a whiteboard with an unsolvable equation on it and then i'll give you a good boston accent so um oh we'll wait for the book or we could maybe and, and at least four guinnesses before he's able to do a true boston accent <laughs> we'll do we'll do a blooper reel um there's a lot yeah. of f words in there too so yeah. you'd be more uh <laughs> um well i should i'm would be derelict in my duty if I didn't tell everybody when Beyond Kuiper is coming out in ebook, print edition with lovely pictures, and our audiobook, uh, audio experience, audiobook edition. Um, it's all coming out November 10th. Yes. And uh, sci fi.com just uh, premiered it yesterday. Oh, trailer, right? Yeah, the trailer, yeah. yes. Yeah. Which is very, very exciting. But yeah, no, the. Uh, it's it's been you know a journey, but really just just kind of starting right now. Really, now now it's the fun part. Yeah. So when they when they do come for us, they'll be proud of the Beyond Kuiper audiobook. You will you will get some respect from the. You know that. I I hope that it's like you know for any anyone watching this that it's seen um, uh, the good place. I hope that our book is basically the Jeremy Baramy of intergalactic space. <laughs> too much <laughs> too much all right we've got a lightning round to close out our esteemed panelists here really really crazy question but very very appropriate for the times we're living in okay dragon con if you were actually going and if you might go next year what would you cosplay as uh character wise and the second is since we're in uh, the time of the apocalypse, um, COVID times. What's in your bug out bag? Who, who's let's, start with, uh, let's start with Robert. Oh, great! I have to go first. Yes. All yes. right. So I would. Uh, I'll pick the cosplay because uh, I have gone to Dragon Con for almost uh, over ten years now. So I uh, love to cosplay as different doctors because there's a giant TARDIS. And I like to hide in it from time to time and pop out, uh, <laughs> cosplaying as one of the doctors. So uh, I have cosplayed as, as Doctor Nine, uh, Ten, uh, Eleven, and Four, uh, and, which was my doctor growing up. I have not co cosplayed as Doctor Twelve uh, because I don't know that I could pull her off. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sticking. I'm sticking with the guy. Doesn't it just involve like a really long scarf? I think I could. Four. Four, yeah, four you could do with a long yeah. scarf and a floppy hat. You'll be set. Okay, it wasn't an either or. What's in your bug out bag? It's both. Oh God, what's in my bug out bag? Um, <laughs> let's see, uh, a lot of batteries. Some. Um, this is not fair. I did not think about this one. Uh, We're getting lightning through it. Lightning round. Uh, okay. Um, don't batteries. know. Batteries. <laughs> batteries. Yeah. Batteries. Nothing to put them in, but you know. We batteries got and guns. Lots of guns. Here's my new <laughs> oh, answer. Oh, 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 let's run out. <laughs> True. True. Not, All right. Laser. Laser gun. gun. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what is in Jonathan's bug out bag because as the, the real the military guy, it's going to be something good. Well, I've done Arctic survival. I've done uh, mountain survival. I've done desert survival, but. Being stuck here right now with COVID, I think uh, besides this whole list of things that I could tell you, very technical, it's got to be Diet Dr. Pepper. <laughs> yes! We're out. Everywhere is out of Diet Dr. Pepper oh, because man. supposedly they're short on aluminum, but they got enough for regular Dr. Pepper. They got enough for Coke. So I don't understand it. 
Oh, Diet Dr. Pepper or Dr. Pepper 10. Dr. I'm with Pepper you on 10. the Diet Dr. Pepper. <laughs> yeah. That stuff is gold. It is. Yep. I, I'm I'm down to my last three bottles I was able to find, and I'm, oh, wow. I'm just sort of uh, rationing myself. <laughs> you know what I found? The Soda Stream. Um, if you if you buy the Soda Stream kit, and you can buy their Diet Dr Pepper syrup, and you can make your own, I've done that a lot, and I've got to say it's the most passable version I've found. <sighs> I gotta try. So it. <laughs> give it a shot. All right, and a pinch. And Jonathan, what are you dressing as? Huh. normally, it's my wife who dresses. Uh, and now with my twin girls at Comic Con, they were Wonder Girl, and they're they're identical twins mm. as Wonder Girl. They were about a year old, or, or just under a year old, so they got a lot of attention. Uh, for me, I saw someone at World Con dressed as Shilob, and it was a huge, huge Shilob. And if I had the guts and the time and energy to create that costume and wander around, of course, it'd be a little hard at dragon con as that's tight as everybody is but that's what i would do nice you get a lot of arachnophobes getting out of your way though <laughs> yeah, there you go yes that would be my Clear son he's so desperately afraid of spiders he would just oh. explode <laughs> just there you go nick what about you uh so the bug out bag i think the most important thing is the machete that's by my bed at all times um and then snacks lots and lots of snacks because i get hangry and <laughs> Nobody needs yeah. that in the apocalypse. So true. You need Twinkies, especially you know Zombie Land. Mm -hmm. That's right. Contrary to popular belief, they do have an expiration date. <laughs> yeah. It's it's fungible though. I mean, it, you yeah. know, it's a guideline. It's a guideline. Uh, Matt, what about you? Well, the the, the machete is is definitely um, a key, but I would I would say a ton of MREs. You know. Mm easy to condense, uh, very nutritious ways to, uh, you know, get from A to B in a pinch, uh, would probably be right next to the machete. And I, I would probably just dress up as Odin. You know, I love, I love the staff. So that would be, that'd be my, uh, my go-to. Nice. Nice. Kyle. Um, for the bag, I gotta say as appealing as a gun is, um, I would say something that I don't have to maintain. So some kind of sword or blade or machete sounds like it would be better in the long run because it's also utilitarian. You can use it to accomplish things and um, kind of change your environment. So that and um, probably a hazmat suit because if we're going to go into some type of future apocalypse from what we're dealing with now, I'm going to want to just protect my skin and all my orifices. <laughs> so, um, all the orifices. Yeah. <laughs> All of them. So, uh, and then for the cosplay, I think I would have to say Thanos because Perfect. I think I identify with Thanos because <laughs> like Thanos, I'm always trying to do what I feel is the right thing for everyone around me, but I'm doing it in the wrong way. So... <laughs> Uh, I think that that would probably be the most representative of just who I am in my core. Like, I, really, I really just want to help because I just want everyone to have a better life. But God damn it, I accidentally killed everyone around me. You know, so. Uh, but it's for their own good. It's for their own good. Yeah. And the fact that I'm, not sure, I'm not sure that one's going to age well. I like, to do yeah. the, I like to do the right thing, but I commit genocide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the so, dolphins did did return to the Hudson, though. So you got you got to at least say that. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Um, but we then, but Captain America's leading support groups. That's super weird. I don't know about that. So, yeah. Um, All right. Well, my um, I'm I've been very focused on what I'm running out of lately, and the key thing I'm running out of is chocolate biscuits, which is like a very English thing. My chocolate digestives, the supply has finally stopped and there are uh -oh. none at the supermarket and it's not good. So I need to rehaul them and that is what is in my supply. That we have lots of those in Georgia. Come down here. We got them. Oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah. You're in Georgia? He's in Atlanta. Yeah, I'm in Georgia. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Apparently all we have in Georgia is biscuits and guns. <laughs> and biscuits are fantastic. Do you have Dr. Diet Dr. Pepper? That's the question. We do have Dr. Pepper too. Yeah. No, I my, my, diet. my dad's yeah. from Marietta. So I've spent much oh, time right. there. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's like five minutes from us. And oh. the of Coca Cola, one would hope that Dr. Pepper is available in Atlanta. It's not, <laughs> it would be a riot. 
Yeah. So, it's true. Yeah. No. He uh, he went to North Springs High School. If you if you live near there. Yep. Yep. <laughs> right near there. Yeah. Tiny world. All right. Well, thank you for playing the lightning round. Wait, wait, wait. What's your what's your cosplay? Oh yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> she yeah. thought she'd getting yeah. out of that. I thought yeah. I was going to get out of it. No, I would be Skippy the Magnificent mainly because it's a can. Mm -hmm. And that would be very easy for me to achieve with cardboard. And That's awesome. Some silver spring paint from our Expeditionary Force series. So, and it would just say "Trust the awesomeness" on the outside. That's great. That would be it. Perfect. That's amazing. And I can hide my snacks in there, and then I can give them to Nick if he gets hangry. That's right. He does get hangry from time to time. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I thank you for uh, spending time with us this afternoon. Um, and here is the whole panel to give a cheery wave. Uh, thanks so much for um, to the Dragon Con organizers. Thank you for inviting us to be part of the virtual con. Thanks to you guys, you creators on this panel. You're inspiring. And I can't wait to listen and read uh, your output. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a fun fall. And uh, thanks very much to you DragonCon attendees for listening to us. Um, as they say, next year, Atlanta. We'll see you there. Thanks, everyone.